Come on, put your hands together. Look at your neighbor and tell him, let's praise the Lord. Lift up a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. I'm going to shout with a voice of triumph. Sing with a voice of praise. I'm going to dance like I've got the victory for my God. Is, my God. My God is more than enough. He supplies all my needs. He is the El Shaddai. The Prince of Peace, he is my all in all. The great I am, he is a mighty savior and my very best friend. I'm gonna shout with a voice of triumph. Sing with a voice of praise. I'm gonna dance like I've got the victory for my God has set me free. I'm gonna shout with a voice of triumph. Sing with a voice of praise. I'm gonna dance like I've got the victory for my God has set me free. My God is more than enough. He supplies all my needs. He is the El Shaddai, the Prince of Peace. He is my all in all. The great I am. He is a mighty Savior and my my God is more than enough. He supplies all my needs. He is the El Shaddai. The Prince of Peace. He is my all in all. Great I am. He is a mighty Savior and my very best friend. Come on, put your hands together. He's more than enough. More than enough for me. He's more than enough. He's more than enough for me. He's more than enough. More than enough for me. He's more than enough. More than enough for me. He's more than enough. More than enough for me. He's more than enough. More than enough for me. He's more than enough. More than enough for me. He's more than enough. My God is more than enough. He supplies all my needs. He is the El Shaddai, the Prince of Peace. He is my all in all. The Great I Am. He is a mighty Savior and my very my God is more than enough. He supplies all my needs. He is the El Shaddai, the Prince of Peace. He is my all in all. The Great I Am. He is a mighty Savior and my very best friend. Somebody shout, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Come on, sing it again. Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. People from every people from every nation and tongue from generation to generation we worship you 
singing hallelujah hallelujah we worship you for who you are come on sing we worship you we worship you singing hallelujah hallelujah we worship you for who you are shout it out you are You are. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. A people from every nation and time, from generation to generation. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship worship you for who you are we worship you we worship you singing hallelujah hallelujah we worship you for who you are shut it up you are Cause you are good all the time and all the time you are good you are good all the time and all the time you are good you are good all the time and all the time you are good you are good all the time and all the time you are good you are good all the time all the time you are good you are good all the time all the time you come on somebody look up a shout of praise same people from every nation and time from generation to generation people from every nation and time from generation to generation people from every nation and time from generation to generation we worship you singing hallelujah hallelujah we worship you for who you are come on sing we worship you we worship you singing hallelujah hallelujah we worship you for who you are sing for who you are for who you are for who you are you are good come on somebody lift up a shout of praise we bless you Lord hallelujah father you are good Good, Jesus. Come on, somebody help me thank him for his goodness this morning. Oh, we thank you, Jesus.
this morning. The demons run and flee at the mention of the name King of Majesty. There is no power in hell, nor any who can stand at the power and the presence of the great I am. The mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of the name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell, nor any who can stand. At the power and the presence of the Great I Am, the Great I Am, Great I Am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy, holy God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee. God Almighty, the great I am, the great I am. Great I am, great I am, great I am. Sounded good. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It's on the screen for you this morning. Going to begin reading out of the new. King James Version. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says, For when we were still without strength. How many has ever felt like you had no strength before? When we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the righteous, the holy, the forgiven, the blessed and not stressed. No. Who did He die for? The ungodly. How many of you are thankful that Christ died for the ungodly this morning? Verse 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Now listen, this is uh, to put this in perspective this morning, think about this. You have a son, and he's your only son, and you're going to send him to the world to die. Let's just say for one person. Now, would you send him to die for someone who is righteous, who gives to the poor, who, who has a good reputation, who everybody knows about and, and, and loves and adores? Would you send him to die for that person? Or would you send him to die for the slumlord who is abusive to women and, 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 and throws his children around and cusses at his wife? Which one would you choose to die for? Or to send your son to die for? We would choose the righteous and the godly and the upright and the, and the one who gives to the poor. That's the person that we would logically choose to send our, in fact, we probably wouldn't send our son, but if we did, that's who we would choose. Amen? Amen. We wouldn't choose the scoundrel. We would choose the sacred. But God the Father sent His Son to die, not for the, not for the righteous man, not, not even for the good man, but in verse 8 it says, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. God the Father picked the scoundrel. Amen? God the Father picked the sinner. God the Father picked the unrighteous. God the Father picked me. Somebody say He picked me. God the Father saw humanity in, in their filthiness, in their, in their rags. The Bible says that even our, our righteousness is like filthy rags. He, he saw that. He saw all the evil things that we would do. He saw all the, all the lifestyles that we would live that would cause Him shame. And He looked at us and He said, you know what? I see, I see someone who is worth dying for. How many glad He saw you this morning? Amen. God saw us and He said, I'm going to send my son to die for them. And we're going to look at why He would do that here in just a little bit. We're going to speak this morning on a message entitled, A Father's Love. A Father's Love. If there is one thing that you leave this place being reminded of this morning, it is simply that you are loved by Father God. Look at your neighbor and say, God loves me. Look at somebody else and say, God loves me. Now look at somebody and say, God loves you. But I'm his favorite. And I'm going to prove that to you here in just a minute. You are loved by Father God. 1 John 3, 1 says, See how very much our Father loves us. For He calls us His children, and that is what we are. I love the exclamation there. God the Father, see how much He loves us because He calls us His children, and that is what we are. He calls, He no longer calls you free. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. He calls you beloved. God loves you this morning. Can somebody say amen? Now we know that, but so many times we forget it. We forget how much He truly, truly loves us. 2 Corinthians 6.18 says, 
and I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You are a child of God, and you are loved by your father. You see, your father, first of all, this morning protects those he loves. The Father protects those He loves. I love Zechariah 2, verse 8. It says, For thus thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. And listen to this. For He who touches you touches the apple of His eye. No matter what the enemy throws at you, no matter who the enemy sends your way, Listen, if they touch you, they are touching the apple of his eye. This is how that is literally interpreted. It says, for he said, anyone who harms you or anyone who harms my most precious possession. Do you hear that this morning? You are his most precious possession. And guess what? You were before you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because Christ died for the who? Ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Seth, do you understand that you are His most precious possession? Now I know you don't like to be called precious. But that's what He said. He said, my precious. He is your most, you are his most precious possession. Now, to to bring this into view this morning, I want you to think about the thing that you own, that you value the most. Now, now, now don't don't get just, just super, super spiritual. I want you to think of a physical thing that you own, that you value the most. For some of you, uh, it could be something that your grandmother gave you, or something that that your daughter made for you, or, or something, uh, teenagers, that, that your uh, BFFFLL whatever gave to you. It could be something that, you know, she gave you. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, it could, it could be something that's just valuable. It may not be worth anything, but it's valuable to you. What do we do with those things? We may put them in a safety deposit box. We may, we may uh, put them in a fire safe at home. We may hide it under our bed. Uh, or we may, you know, uh, dig a hole in the ground and put it there and, and put a little flag there. You know, I don't know. Whatever you do, but you're going to protect that thing, aren't you? How many of you have seen a movie before where a robber would come in and, and uh, a thief would come in and he would steal a bunch of money and different things, but in there would be a little trinket that was worth nothing, and they would say, you can keep the money, just give me the necklace. You know what I'm talking about? It's that most valuable possession, that most precious possession. That, my friend, is what you are to God, and He will defend you. He will protect you at all costs because He does not want to lose you. Amen? So God comes, and He wants to protect his most valuable, his most precious possession. Your father, secondly, provides for those he loves. So your father protects those he loves, and he secondly provides for those he loves. Matthew 6, we know this scripture, verse 26 says, Look at the birds. They don't plant. They don't harvest. They don't store food in barns. For your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? You're more valuable. You're His most precious possession. 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his own... Now listen to this this morning. If anyone doesn't provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Tell that to American economy today. Amen? Anybody who doesn't provide for his own household is worse than an unbeliever. Listen, uh, 
How many of you know if God set that standard for us, that we who have been adopted into His household as children of God, how many of you know that He's going to live up to that standard? And He's going to provide for those in His household. Listen, if you ever have a scare that, well, God's not going to provide for my needs. God's not going to, not going to allow this bill to be paid. God's not going to... And, and we, we do that and we worry and we stress and we fret about these things. We have to have the firm belief that God will provide for those who belong to His household. Somebody say, I'm His household. He's going to provide for me. That's the God that we serve. He's going to provide. Listen, consider Adam. We're going to do this a few times this morning. Consider Adam. Think about this. God created the heavens and the earth. He created all the birds, all the animals and the fish. He created all the, the trees and the, and the plants that, the, the, and, and everything. And, and then he, he created Adam. And he created Adam in his own image, which we're going to look at here in just a few minutes. But Adam did not have to worry about anything, did he? He didn't have to worry about what he was going to eat. Adam didn't have to worry about where he was going to sleep. Yeah, Adam didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. And listen, that is the way God meant for it to be. Amen? That is the way God desires it to be. In fact, the Bible says in the New Testament, you say, well, well Pastor Travis... That was in the Garden of Eden, but guess what? Jesus said, hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Don't worry about any of that. He doesn't want you to even be concerned with that. Listen, He wants you to live your life in service to Him, and I can promise you that He's going to provide for your every need. The Word says it like this, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. God ain't going to have His children begging for bread. Amen? And listen, He just wants to provide an abundance for you. And we, and we have to understand that. But listen, we have got to begin to see ourselves as the children of God. And just like God desired to provide for Adam, Jesus came and He paid a price on the cross of Calvary so that He could provide for us in the same way. Alright. Let's look at this. Our Father declared His love for you. Our Father declared His love for you. Jeremiah 31.3 says it like this. Long ago, the Lord said to Israel, and how many knows that we're adopted into that family? Amen. I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with unfailing love, I have drawn you to Myself. I am thankful that God's love is everlasting. It never stops. It never stops. What does everlasting mean? It means forever, right? Forever? Does that mean that you're going to do something that's going to cause God to stop loving you? Huh? No? No, it's everlasting? I don't see a condition in there. It says, my love is everlasting and my love is unfailing. All right. Austin, guess what? I know that you're madly, deeply infatuated with Katerina. Right? Is that okay to say? And I'm, I'm hoping she feels the same way about you. You too? But guess what? Your love's going to fail her. Right? Are you human? Guess what? My love's going to fail you too. But she, and, and she's going to fail you at times as well, isn't she? But guess what? God never fails us, does He? His love is unfailing, unaltering. It has no flaws. It is flawless. It is a flawless love. That's the love that God has for you, His children. He, he has that desire, that, that urgency to know you more, and He wants you to have that same love toward Him, but He understands that our love will always fail us, and our love will always fail others. But God's love never fails. Amen? So His love is everlasting and His love is unfailing. You see, your Father thinks of you constantly. Some of you in this room may come from a home where you don't even know who your Father really is. 
You may come from a home where your father never thinks of you. You may come from a home where your father is abusive, may say, may, may be an alcoholic, he may be on drugs, your father may, uh, may be neglectful, but guess what? Your heavenly father thinks of you constantly. You're always, always on his mind. He can't wait to spend time with you. He can't wait to talk to you. He can't wait to hear about your day. Your father is constantly thinking of you. Psalm 139, 17 through 18 says it like this. How precious are your thoughts about me. Oh God, they cannot be numbered. I can't even count them because they outnumber the grains of sand. How many believes the Bible's true? Are there any flaws in the Word? At all? No? Hey, by the way, I, I got upgraded this week. This is a side note. Uh, Pamela asked me, she said, have you ever took that towel that you wiped your head with home and washed it? And I said, No. And we got to talking about it, and we realized it was the same towel that Pastor Tom was wiping his sweat with when he was here. And it was getting rough and kind of dry and brittle, and now I've got a nice, soft, poofy towel. And uh, that's how much Father loves me this week. But how many of you truly believe the Bible's true? Yeah? Think about this. It doesn't say the, gr the grains of sand on the Atlantic coast. It doesn't say the grains of sand in Galveston, Texas. It says they outnumber the grains of sand. Think about that. There's no way you could count the grains of sand in a cup, in an eight ounce cup, styrofoam cup. However, the word says all the grains of sand all over the world can't even come up with a number. His thoughts are more than that. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? That's how much your father loves you. He loves you more than the grains of sand. I believe that is truth this morning. How many of you believe that that is true? Your father is constantly thinking about you. Your father loves you just as he loves Christ. His one and only Son. Watch this. John 17, 23 says, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. This is Jesus saying, hey, let them experience this thing. Let them experience such unity because we're one with Christ, amen? And what Christ is saying is I want them to know that you love them as much as you love me. Listen to this. He loves you so much that He sent that one and only Son, Jesus, to die so that He could no longer be the father of one, but the father of billions. Amen? God loves you so much that He was willing to give up His one son because He understood if He gave up the one son that He would now be the father of many. This is the kind of love that God has. And not only does He love you that much, but He says, I love you as much as I do my only son. Alright, let's consider Adam. The Word says in Genesis 1.26, says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our own image to be like us. Like who? To be like who? God? To be like God. Jeremiah 1.5 says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. So God knew us from the beginning. In the beginning, He created us to be in His own image, to be like God. He created us to be this way. And, and for all of time, 
He has known us and He has formed us in our mother's womb. Tell that to abortionists. They say that you have to reach a, a certain stage in pregnancy before you, before you have life and, and all of those things, but the Bible says before you were ever even in there, God knew you. Amen? Now, I'm not trying to make anybody feel condemned this morning, but we have to understand that God loved us and He knew us before He ever formed us. But listen, there's something to be said about how He formed us. In the beginning, God created human beings in His own image. He, he looked at Adam and He said, he said or he, he, he knew Adam and He created him and He made him and He formed him and He shaped him to be exactly how He wanted him. I believe Adam had no flaws. I believe that God made him exactly how He wanted him. And he looked at Adam and in all the provisions that he had made, all the birds and the plants and the animals and the, and the sea creatures and all of these things, he looked at Adam and he said, you know what, Adam is, is, is lonely. And so I'm going to form a woman, not a man. Amen? I'm thankful. He created a woman. And I believe it was the kind of woman that like when I look at my wife, it's like, whoa, man, like that. I mean, I believe she was too flawless. And so he created human beings from the beginning in his own image, and, and he created them exactly how he wanted them. But guess what? That hasn't stopped. I believe that God creates us, and he forms us, and he says, he says, okay, I want, I want Travis to have blue eyes, and, and, I, and I want him to have... have fairly large nose and and I want him to one day he's going to be bald but that's going to be okay because his wife's going to think bald's beautiful and 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 all of this and he creates us just the way he wants us but you know what we do we stand in the mirror and we say man I hate my nose I hate my ears I hate that I have no hair I hate and and, and when we say this I'm, I'm too I'm too fat and too skinny I've never met a person that thinks they're just right and and you know and we do all these things we go back and forth and, uh, and but listen the Bible says God formed you because He loved you and He knew you and He knew exactly what you need to look like and He knew why you need to look that way and He made you in the way that He wanted to. Somebody say, God made me. All right, so if you don't like it, take it up with Him. Psalm 139, 13 says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. And knit me together in my mother's womb. Not only did he make your nose and your ears and, and, uh, and your thighs, whether you like them or not, whether you got thunder thighs or, or, or chicken legs, it don't matter. All right? He made you. But not only did he make all of those features, but he made all the delicate inner parts of your body, like your intestines and your kidneys and, 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 and all of these things. You know, he, he took time to create these things, you are a creative miracle. Don't let anybody else tell you something different. You are a creative miracle designed by Father God who loves you so much. Just to help you, there wasn't a speck in space somewhere that that expanded and exploded and, and, and then just all of a sudden human beings were, were formed and with, with all the inner parts. And, and No, your father created you. Amen? <laughs> your father created It sounds silly, but really, a lot of times when we're standing in front of that mirror and we say, oh, I don't like the way I look, I don't like the way I feel, I don't like the way I do this, I don't like the way I do that, and we stand in there and we self-evaluate ourselves, what you we're really saying is, God, I don't like the way you created me. I, I don't like the way you did that. That's really what we're saying. So we have to understand that God created us and He formed us out of His love. Now listen, our Father, and we're coming to a close here this morning, demonstrated His love to you. Our Father demonstrated His love to you. Romans 5, 6, back to our beginning text. But looking at it in the New Living Translation says... 
When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good, but God. Somebody say, but God. Showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. The first way that your Father demonstrated His love for you this morning is by giving us His Son. The Bible says in the verse that we all know so well, John 3.16, for God so loved. Somebody say so loved. That's really great love. God loved the world so greatly that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever, you've not went too far, you haven't done too much, whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have ever Lasting life. Your Father showed His love by giving everlasting, eternal life. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says, But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised us. Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that we have been saved. God gave us life. Not only life, but everlasting life. Your Father showed His love by giving us the Holy Spirit. How many of you are thankful for the Holy Spirit this morning? Romans 5.5 5. We're landing here this morning. It says, And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because He gave us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with what? Whose love? His love? God loves you so much that He sent the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with Father's love. Listen, that is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is so that you can come to know and understand the love of your Father. Watch this. Consider Adam. Romans 5.12 says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone had sinned. Adam's death represents separation from God. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given what? New life. So Adam's sin led to death. That death represented separation from God, but because of the price that Jesus paid on the cross, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. That new life represents new access to Father's presence. New access to Father's presence. Guess what? That means today I've got a, something I'm believing for today. I've got a vehicle that I'm believing that's going to be sold today. I'm praying. I'm hoping. I am believe. You know, it's, it's not a done deal yet, but I'm believing it's going to be a done deal. But guess what? I have access to Father's presence to say, Father, I need you to make this happen. Amen? Do we have that kind of access? How about God... Uh, some of us in this room may be, God, you know how the bills are mounting up. I, I need your help. Do you have access to Father's presence? How about this? God, you know I, I messed up this weekend. You know, you know I slipped. I, I, I sinned. I, 
I said something I shouldn't have. I flipped somebody off at the intersection over here. I made out with my girlfriend or boyfriend. I looked at something on the internet that I shouldn't have looked at. I messed up, God. I need you to forgive me. Let me ask you something this morning. Do you have access for that? Yeah? How about God? I'm living a lifestyle. I didn't just mess up. I'm living a lifestyle of sin. And your word says that sin separates me from you. And I want fellowship with you, my Father. I want, I want fellowship with you. Listen, do you have access for that? Then why do I hear all the time, I've done too much to go back to God? Why do I hear all the time, you don't know what I've done, you don't know the things that I've done in this life, you don't, why do we hear those things, or, or why do I hear I've gone too far this time? Show me that in Scripture. It's not there, is it? Listen, if you willfully go to Father and ask Him for forgiveness, He is faithful and just to forgive. Guess what? That's not pastor's theology. That's Scripture. That's Word of God this morning. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. You have access to Father's presence because of the price that Jesus paid at Calvary talking about a father's love this morning. Somebody say he loves me. Let's close with this scripture. Ephesians 3 verse 18 says, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should. That's important. As all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. Listen, may you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully. Now these two scriptures almost sound like they're contradicting themselves. If we go back to verse 18, it says, and may you have the power to understand as God's people, as all God's people should how great His love is. And the very next word says that it's too great to understand fully. But listen to me this morning. That is why He sent the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit. What did the Bible say? That when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive what? Power. And the verse prior to this says that we need to be granted the power to understand Father's love fully. Because you know what? Our love is not unconditional. Our love is not unfailing. Our love is not everlasting. Our love is flawed. It's blemished. It, it fails us. It causes us to stumble. It causes us to say some stupid things sometimes. So we don't understand it. We don't understand how somebody could spit in our face, could mock us, could abuse us, could live a lifestyle uh, that is demonstrated in hating us. We can't, we can't grasp with our minds how God still loves us. Because we probably wouldn't love. But the words say in here that it's God's desire to grant us the power through the Holy Spirit to understand how high, how deep, how wide, how long, how unchanging, how unfailing, how everlasting, how unflawless Father's love is for us. Amen? Now I'm passionate about it this morning, but I'm telling you, most Christians walk around feeling like God's mad at them. God's disappointed with them. Well, you know what? God hates it when we sin. Amen? And God really hates it when we choose a lifestyle that is not pleasing to Him. Because that separates us from His presence. But God loves us enough to say, you know what? When you're ready, 
when you're ready to come back into fellowship with me, I'm there waiting. The Bible says it like this, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But many times what we do is we say, Father, I know you love me. I know you care for me. But I want to do things my way right now. And you know what? He never left us, but we can sure leave Him, can't we? Can't we? We can leave Him. But the Word says that He is always wooing us back. He's always wooing us back. He's always calling us back. He's always drawing us. Listen, 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 listen. listen. He wants you back. He wants you back. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here this morning, you say, I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Therefore, I've never come to know the love of Father God. But I want to do that today. I'd like for you to raise your hand anywhere in this room. Raise it real tall where I can see. Okay. If you're here this morning, you say, you know what, I'm in fellowship with Christ, but... Here lately, I've been doing my own thing. I've slipped. I've messed up. And I want to get forgiveness from Father God so that I can have fellowship with Him once again. I'd like for you to raise your hand anywhere in this room. You say, I need to come back to Father God. A stand this morning. You know, we do things a lot of ways in church and we create a lot of man-made things and, and a lot of them serve a good purpose. But how many of you know that all you have to do is simply ask for forgiveness and He's going to forgive you? Amen? Let's all pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank You for dying on the cross for me. Father, thank you for loving me enough to send your son so that I can become your son as well. Help me to live a life that pleases you. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my lifestyle that is not pleasing to You. Help me to live for You fully with every thought, every action, every word, every desire. Help me to give them to You. I want to live for You all the days of my life. Thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap for those who raised their hand this morning. Now listen, before you move, this is what happens when I don't have a watch. Oh, I'm good. (laughs) Father loves me. I just want to pray over you this morning. This is what I want to do. I want to pray over you this morning that all of us will leave this place reminded of how much Father loves us. Amen? I want you to leave feeling. The Bible said, let them experience your great love. The word, that's what the Word said. Let them experience this. But not just hear about it. I want you to experience it in some way. Listen, Father showed us that He loved us by giving me cheese on my sandwich Friday. I'm serious. Father loved us enough. To, he, he, knew, he knew that we needed, a, needed that that room on the top floor with a view overlooking the water Lake Hamilton he he knew we needed that father knew that I really wanted that salad from Olive Garden it's like the best thing there you know 
And, and uh, I want you to experience some of this love of Father. How many wants to experience that? Amen. I'm not saying He's always going to give you what you want. Look, God is not your genie in the bottle. You're not going to rub on Him and, and Him poof out and say, I'll grant you three wishes. That's not the way God works. But God will do some things for you just to show you that He cares for you, just to show you that He loves you, and that you are His children. The Word said this morning, He said, you are my children, and that is what we are. So let's pray. Father, today I pray over our people this morning, God. Lord, I pray that they will come to know the love of Father God. Lord, I pray you will do some suddenlies like we talked about last week. God, in their life, Lord, will suddenly, they will experience your love. Father, in whatever way, Lord God, it doesn't matter, Father, but I pray that they will walk away knowing that their Father has done something that shows that He loves them, God. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that they will live for you, God, that they will serve you all the days of their life. God, I pray, Lord, that it'll be even in the most unexpected ways, God, that you will show your love to them. Father, I pray that they will come to experience and to know, God, how deep, how wide, how great and everlasting and unfailing your love is. God, I pray for those who have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, God. Lord, I pray that you will begin to birth in them a desire, Lord God, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit so that they can be immersed in your unfailing love, God. So that they can be immersed in that, Father. Lord, I pray that you just bless them today and that they will walk away from this place knowing that they are truly loved. And we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, everybody shouted, Amen. One more time, let's give Him praise. Amen. You're dismissed this morning. God, you are higher than any other.